Good evening, everyone. This is Making the Case. I'm Laverne McGee, in for Yo D. Week two of another emotional and important trial is underway in Minnesota. Former Brooklyn Center police officer Kim Parter is charged with manslaughter for the death of Dante Wright. Wright was 20 years old when he was killed back on April 11th. Now, Potter says she mistakenly drew and fired her gun instead of her taser when she shot him during a traffic stop. She is expected to testify once the defense begins presenting its case. But this week, we're hearing more from the state. Joining me now to talk about today's testimony, veteran prosecutor and BNC legal contributor Paul Henderson and criminal defense attorney Rick Petrie. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. All right, so one of the focuses today for prosecutors is Kim Potter's claim that she accidentally fired her gun instead of her taser. The state questioned Special Agent Brent Peterson from Minnesota's Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, one of the agencies involved in reviewing the shooting. Here's what he had to say about something that he observed as soon as she got out of her car that day. It, it appeared to me uh, in watching this that there was a, a, a manipulation in some way of her holster. Why did that attract your attention? Um, I, I've seen it before. Um, on other videos I've watched of officers, it, I myself um, have done that when I was uh, on patrol. Um, just caught my attention. According to this special agent, it is not uncommon for an officer to manipulate their weapon in a situation like this. But Paul, how does this impact Potter's defense? if an expert says this was happening as Potter arrived on the scene? Well, it matters because it's an indication that she's conscious and aware of where her weapon is. And that matters because this whole case turns on the mistake of using her gun instead of a taser, because that's a mistake that has consequences. The real issue is the legal interpretation of was that mistake reckless or was that mistake negligence? Either one gets prosecution to a guilt, but the fact that she was fumbling around or touching or making motions or gestures where either her weapon was or where her taser was is an indication of consciousness of it before she even had the encounter. And the part that is unspoken, and this is the part that I think is really relevant here, that I'd like to hear more testimony from prosecution, from officials inside the department, talking about, one, the encounter itself and how that encounter subjectively escalated into the use of lethal force, and then also the lack of focus to de-escalate the situation. That's what I want to hear about, and that's why all of these furtive movements or touching around her weapon at all matters, because it all goes to her state of mind and what she was thinking, what she was doing, before she made the, as she says, the mistake of grabbing the wrong thing, which was the gun instead of the taser. Mm, okay, so Rick, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I think there's also another piece of this puzzle that hasn't yet been talked about, but I anticipate that it will be. And that is her reaction after she realized that she had shot this young man. She immediately said, I shot him. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I, I can't believe I shot him. And to me, that flies straight into the teeth of this theory that she was authorized to shoot him. And part of the reason that she discharged either the firearm or the taser was because the other officer was on the other side of the car. And if she didn't do something, that he was going to be drugged down the street. Those two just don't go together. The other thing that I think was interesting today was they brought in this compilation of videos. They had three different body camera video angles and they got into this uh, testimony about where the various officers were located when the shots were fired. This again goes to this notion that she was justified. In fact, you probably heard in the opening statements that they went as far as to suggest that even if she fired the firearm, it, you know, even if she had done it on purpose, she would have been justified. I don't know that that's going to hold up. I don't see evidence supporting that. Mm, okay, so the prosecution also showed the jury the difference between the taser and the service weapon that Kim Potter had on her belt. We also heard from another special agent who testified about the differences between the two. Here are the pictures that the jury saw. 
Special Agent Sam McGinnis noted that the taser, when activated, has a light and laser that helps officers aim. He also noted that the gun weighs more than twice the amount of the taser. And one more critical piece of information, he said Potter did not perform a function test on the taser the day of the shooting, which is required by her department. Paul, how important was that information for the prosecution, particularly that function test? Do you know what it, that might entail? Yeah, I, I do. That's where you have to check your weaponry before you are armed and before you go out into the field. And that is a function of, again, training. And the training is important because this officer was the training officer. She had 26 years of training and experience. And if she did not follow her own advice, if she did not follow her own training, if she did not follow the rules of the department, which is what prosecution is asserting, that contributes to making a mistake. That contributes to the accountability for your mistake. And again, as I've said before, some mistakes have legal consequences. If your mistakes are reckless, if your mistakes are negligence, then those mistakes can be held criminally liable. And that's why this is all absolutely relevant. The factors that go into evaluating whether or not it was a justified mistake go into the differences between the gun and the taser. And you talked about some of them, but there's even more that we haven't even focused on, which was the safety on tasers, which was the color of the taser. And again, and I think this is where we started, the training surrounding how and when to use tasers that she should have been an expert in. And on that day, she was acting as a trainer for another officer, which heightens and elevates the reliance on training. And so we just should not have had this ending. And that's exactly why we're having this trial. It's, it's a real travesty. Oh, it certainly is. And when cross-examining Special Agent McGinnis, the defense brought up some significant points. Special Agent McGinnis said Kim Potter was the only person in her entire department that had that new model of taser. McGinnis also said the taser was designed with a trigger similar to a gun. So, Rick, do you think the defense gained some ground with that information? I don't know about that. You know, I, I've been watching this trial and, and this particular defense attorney you got to watch him. He's a, he's a bit wily. He will he will say things that may or may not be supported by the evidence. So I don't know about that. I mean, it's it's it seems interesting to me. He says that the gun was black, and then he said, "Well, did you call him and ask him why they designed it to be just like a gun?" That's absolutely nonsense. It's the exact opposite. Tasers are intentionally designed to be so dissimilar to guns that it would be extremely difficult to mistake one for the other. And when they asked about the weight of the gun, he didn't have anything to say about that as compared to the weight of the taser. So I don't know about that. And the other thing you got to watch with this particular attorney, and I'm, I'm referring to Earl Gray, is he's sort of a bully. He's, he's sort of bullying the judge when the uh, prosecuting attorney was asking, Josh was asking about this video and where people were located. He, Gray basically sort of bullied the judge into stopping him from talking about that video. And it's it's very commonplace for a piece of evidence to be offered and received by the court and then for witnesses to be able to talk about that evidence. That's that's nothing novel. And he uh, Gray suggested that it was expert testimony, that he was offering some sort of an expert opinion. There was no expert opinion. He was merely testifying about his observations regarding that particular piece of video. So I don't know about that. What he's trying to do, he's just trying to throw some stuff out there uh, and plant some seeds of doubt in the jury's mind, but there, it's, it's, there's, the evidence just doesn't seem to be there to support it. Yeah, interesting tactics. Rick and Paul, I'd like you to stay with us. We'll talk more about today's testimony and what to expect for the rest of the week. Welcome back, everyone. We're talking about week two of testimony in the trial of Kim Potter. She's the former Brooklyn Center, Minnesota officer, police officer charged with manslaughter for the shooting death of Dante Wright. Back with me, BNC legal contributor Paul Henderson and criminal defense attorney Rick Petrie. Thanks so much for staying with us, gentlemen. Today, jurors saw what's become two common graphic images of a young black person killed by police. 
Now, we're not going to show those pictures out of respect for the family, but I want you both to react to the significance that seeing these images over and over again, the impact it might have on jurors. Rick, you first. Yeah, you know, it's it's sad to see that. I, I saw the videos and the images when they first took him out of the vehicle and had him laying on the ground, even the images uh, of the autopsy. You know, those are, I think, very troubling pictures for the jury to see. Certainly troubling for me to see it. I think about could be me or could be my son or any of the students that I've taught over the years. So I think that those will have a pretty significant impact on the jury. That's why they're being offered. They're, they're prejudicial uh, and we'll have to see, but yeah, those pictures aren't fun to watch. Yeah, Paul, what do you think about that? I mean, to be honest with you, they make me angry. I feel like for me, uh, as a prosecutor, as a contributor, finding uh, new words to come up with things that I've seen over and over are frustrating. I think for a jury and seeing those images and watching videos like this, uh, it somewhat feels desensitizing uh, to just watch it over and over, especially when you have to look at that video uh, and analyze it through a tool of legal terms and legal analysis that they're expected to do, which is hard. And it's a difference when you've seen it the seventh time from the first time, because of course, anytime you see something like that, it's very shocking. And it has to be colored with a narrative where someone is explaining to you what you're about to watch and what to pay attention to. I think the difference in terms of both sides, how the prosecution is trying to paint that video versus how the defendant and the defense team is trying to paint that video is what stands out to me. And if you noticed from the very beginning of this trial, prosecution was talking about Dante as a person and humanizing him. And they ended up closing their opening arguments with an empty jacket showing you a symbol of him being in the courtroom and weighing on their minds before they saw their video, which is a big contrast to how defense attorney is talking about the same video and the things that he's saying. And as he began his opening statements, he was talking about what a bad person the defendant was. And he was trying to do a character assassination of Mr. Wright and make him portray him out to be a, a negative person, someone associated with crime and bad behavior. And so all of that goes into looking at the video, which by itself, without explanation, is shocking, it's upsetting, uh, and has an influence on the jury, both in how they analyze the evidence that they're hearing and their emotional response to seeing a young black man killed in front of them on a video while some of the parties are there in the courtroom with them because Dante Wright is not there, he's dead, but his girlfriend is there and testifying, his family is there and they're in the courtroom and representatives from the community are there on his behalf. And so, you know, it's, it's all across the board, but this is all part of what needs to be done in order to translate into a specific measurement of accountability for what happened. That's why we're all here. Yeah, I can't imagine how his family feels knowing that that's being played or seeing it themselves. But something else that we've seen before came up in court. Paul, you kind of alluded to this. An autopsy revealed that Dante Wright had marijuana in his system at the time of his death. Here's how the medical examiner addressed that when questioned by the prosecution. Were those toxicology results that you received in any way significant with respect to your determination of cause and manner of death? No, they were not. And then on exam, did you find any natural disease or natural defect uh, that would have caused Mr. Wright's death? No, the only thing we found were uh, injury-related uh, changes associated with the gunshot wound. Even okay. after that answer on cross-examination, the defense asked the medical examiner to determine how often Dante used marijuana and if his THC levels were exceptionally high. Uh, Rick, I want you to weigh in on this. Why go this direction? Well, I think it goes to what something that Paul said just a minute ago. They're trying to dehumanize this young man. They're trying to make him look like a bad guy. Like this is a guy, young black man, he smoked a lot of weed or marijuana, whatever you want to call it. 
and don't worry about him. I, I even noticed uh, several times when uh, the defense attorney pretended like he didn't know his name and called him different names. I mean, that is that is nothing more than a tactic to try and dehumanize this young man. That's what it's all about. It's it's smoke and mirrors. It has nothing at all to do with the cause of death. It has really no bearing on any of the conduct at issue here. It's trying to put the focus on him as the bad guy and to take the focus off this officer and her conduct. That's all it is. Yeah, we hear it too often in these type of cases. So the state filed two motions today. One was designed to limit testimony of witnesses who are not testifying as experts. That came after a former Brooklyn Center officer made comments on the stand indicating Potter's actions were authorized under the law. The other motion sought permission to question police officers about union membership since Potter previously held leadership positions in the union. Paul, why are those motions significant to the prosecution's case? Well, there's significance for a couple of reasons. And one, the prosecution wants to control the narrative of the information that comes in. And so when they had that other officer saying that the use of force could have been justified for these other reasons, that is not helpful to their case. But it's also a distraction from the law in terms of what's relevant for this trial. Because what happens is use of force, especially lethal force, the standard is a reasonable officer. And in this case, this is a real issue for this reasonable officer because defense keeps bringing up the fact and made it very clear in the beginning that this use of force could have been justified anyway, could have been being the operative word. The real issue is that this actual officer never thought that she was justified in using lethal force, as we saw from her statements where she was saying she made a mistake, she made a mistake, taser, taser. She thought it was a taser. The criminal issue is that that mistake has criminal consequences. And so what prosecution is trying to do is to make sure that they have people on the stand that understand the law and will testify with the line of questioning to focus on that officer under those circumstances as we saw in the tape and nothing more. Now, the issue that I'm paying attention to that I'm noticing, and this is a different and a departure from what we saw in the George Floyd case, was where we saw actual leadership coming in and talking about how this was a departure from the training, which I think is important, especially in this case, training matters, and in the execution of the discretion that the officer used that led to lethal force. This was someone that should not have faced lethal encounter, a lethal encounter like this. They could have let him get away. They could have written him a ticket. They could have issued another warrant. They could have found him at his home. It did not need to happen in this way. And that's the testimony that I'd like to see from more of the leadership from law enforcement, the law enforcement agency here, and not the distracting testimony that I think prosecution is trying to limit with these motions, that's the whole point of these motions, to not have people that are coming up to testify that want to help the defendant because they're her friend, or want to interpret on behalf of the defendant for a separate set of interpretations not related to this specific case because they think it will benefit her case. That's the issue. That's why prosecution wants to limit who is going to be called to testify and what they'll be qualified to testify about. 